people are attracted to confidence. They are attracted to simplicity and someone who can give them a clear, clean, don't eat this, it will kill you. Eat this, it will make you super powerful. It's very attractive. Welcome back to Evolving, the podcast designed to help you strive, thrive, and optimize. Today, I'm here with Avisha Ness Aver, the founder of Distilled Science, a personal blog dedicated to science fact optimization and performance. He is a founder, speaker, futurist, and engineer. Today, we're talking about how technology can be used to improve our lives, from productivity gadgets to health tech. Avisha, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. As anyone who's seen your videos can attest to, your enthusiasm for STEM is really infectious and your charisma just leaps off the screen. You recently started a series where you aim to 10x your health, productivity, and income. Talk just a little bit about this endeavor and how it came about. So overall, the goal was to be more ambitious than practical, which is not generally normal for me because I usually I'm super practical, practical about everything. But when I first conceived it, I was thinking to, about doing, oh, I'm just going to try to double everything. And then I realized, why not shoot for as high as possible and then see where we land? There's a lot of studies around framing where if you start the framing at a higher point, then you're a lot more likely to uh, go higher. Just like the Olympics back in the you know 1800s, early 1900s versus now, the gold medalists then wouldn't even rank. So it's all about shooting as high as possible. I love that. And I think I've even seen some research suggesting that it's better to have slightly unattainable goals and fall slightly short than to have something that's consistently attainable just in terms of the outcomes that those different approaches lead to. So that that approach itself seems science backed in a way. Yeah, there's actually a really interesting study and set of studies that I've been meaning to talk about in a more concrete way for a while, which is basically the optimal failure point for maximal learning and improvement seems to be around an 80-20 split. No surprise for people who are familiar with the 80-20 rule, but basically if you're doing something, you should aim to fail at it at least 20% of the time so that what you're doing is most effective from a learning perspective. Like if you're going and taking a test on something and you're getting a hundreds the entire time, you're probably not testing yourself hard enough as opposed to if you're actually hitting that 80% number, then you are striving, you are thinking, you are attempting and you are failing, but at the sweet spot for actually improving as much as possible. Interesting. Does that 80-20 rule also perhaps apply to motivation? If you're accomplishing your goals 80% of the time, are you more likely to stick with it versus if you hit the target a less percentage of the time? Or, you know, perhaps if you hit it more than that, you might get complacent. I would extrapolate and say that it's not a bad heuristic to use. The research itself was a little bit more about task-based learning, but the reason for it seems to be a little bit more basic in terms of the structure of how your brain works. It's you're always trying to do a little bit more so that then what you land on has the greatest effect rather than not challenging yourself enough or challenging yourself too much. Like if you go into a foreign country and you don't understand any words, it's going to be hard to pick things up as opposed to if you understand some and then can work towards understanding more, the best sort of like maximum learning speed will likely be if you understand a good percentage of it. And then you've got those added bits that you're constantly filling in. Gotcha. And I guess there's also a case for total immersion when it comes to learning a language. Yeah, languages are a little bit different than most because there's separate language centers in the brain. The whole total immersion thing is how we literally are born and exposed to. So it does work a little bit differently. But the overall concept of you take you take me and send me to China, I'm not going to just pick up the language by being there for a couple of weeks. Basically, if I were to compare the language learning speed with just throwing me in total immersion versus giving me guided exposure where I'm getting the appropriate, sure, maybe total immersion is good to just sort of train the subconscious to pick out the different tonalities and phrases and all that. And that's why that's really good. But in terms of the actual learning process, it's better to learn at a pace where as I'm testing myself on smaller blocks, I'm trying to hit that getting 80% correct for any given self-test difficulty level type thing. Going back to your first question, which I didn't actually answer fully. <laughs> which is the whole day X challenge, 10 Xing everything. The goal there is really actually to retarget my overall content strategy a little bit. In the last couple of years since I started this whole channel, I started off doing a lot of pandemic related science just because that was the most applicable when it comes to science to help your current health situation 
and the disparate understanding levels between the science and what people understood about it. So had a lot of focus there. But in terms of what actually interests me and what I like to focus on a lot is how can I take science and apply it to improve my day-to-day -day life and then share that with other people to help them do the same. And the overall striations there are essentially my physical health, my mental health, which is intrinsically linked to my physical health, and then how that affects my output and how can I affect both the practices that I do, the environment that I surround myself with, and the things that I consume or otherwise use on my body to do that. I love that. You briefly talked about the tools that you use on a daily basis to help you with productivity, namely Todoist, Speechify, and Notion. Could you give us a brief walkthrough of what your workflow looks like on a daily basis? Sure. And this is something that is a constantly evolving process. So some of these tools, like I've been using Notion and Speechify for many years in various contexts. I guess I'll start. Speechify is the simplest, but also most used of the bunch in that it's essentially just an app that takes text and reads it to you. There's a browser extension you can click to take an article and save it or just read it right there. There's a uh, iPhone app or Android app, maybe, but at least an iPhone app that you can send content to and then just have it play in whatever voice you want. And it will also let you read the text that gets highlighted as it's reading. Pretty simple. There's a lot of apps that do things similar, but the overall set of features, especially the highlighting as you are reading, is just very easy to both alternate between reading and listening rather than having to use two separate apps to do that. And the ability to just listen to things allows me to multitask. So I spend my day, like I wake up, I put my headphones in, I go to the bathroom and I'm already listening to some book article or podcast. Like sometimes it's an audiobook. A lot of the times it's like an ebook that I have broken up into parts and funneled into the app and I'm just listening to the computer. And a lot of people say, oh no, but it just sounds like a robot. You get over that very, very quickly. And then it turns into just like when you read words on a page, your mind is absorbing the words and then creating whatever voices or imagery you want in your own head. It's the same thing. As long as it reads you the words in a way that your brain can parse, then everything else happens internally. In the last two years, I've listened to over 25 million words using the Speechify app just because I, I listen a lot. Well, and if I'm cooking, if I'm cleaning, walking, going to the gym, whatever, I'm listening to something. It's not always text-to-speech, but that's a reasonable percentage of stuff. That's incredible. 25 million. Yeah, I was recently talking with the CEO of the company, and it, I think I'm the number one user of the app. <laughs> it's wow. a very popular app. <laughs> so, that's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> that, was, that was a pretty funny discovery. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, they're like, yeah, the other the highest number we've seen is like 14 million. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So there's just like there's not even much competition. Like there's such a there's such a disparity between number one and two. So it's see. You know, maybe they were just pandering to my ego, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's also these days like I'll periodically email them bug complaints where it's like, oh, this is crashing. They're they're very good at working to then try and help with that, <laughs> but it's like the one the one drawback to the app is that it it'll occasionally crash with certain things, but most people don't stress test it in the same way that I do. Like the yeah. standard use case is totally different than what I'm doing. Yes, you're you're definitely providing yeah. the the heavy use test case. I'm sure it's appreciated. Well, they've they've been pretty nice and responsive. So then the other two apps that you mentioned, the Todoist and Notion. Notion is basically how I organize my brain. To describe it for folks who don't know what it is, it is a note-taking app on steroids combined with a content management system. So rather than just a note-taking app where you can take notes and put in images and text and maybe links and such, Notion allows you to create databases that can link between themselves as what you can have as items in the database is a page that can then have images and other tables and embedded pages that link to other ones. So I have a whole Notion page that I call Avisha's back brain, which itself is broken up into like sources and tools and uh, ideas, skills, entities, themes. So if I'm listening to a podcast and I think, oh, this is one I really want to take notes on and make it interesting, it will store it for later use. What I'll do is, as I'm listening to it, I will create a page in my sources table that's this podcast that I then tag as a podcast, link to the podcast as a whole along with the author, 
And like the author of that podcast will be an entity. That entity has its own page, which automatically creates the cross links. I go to that page and I see anything else that that author has put out. As I'm listening, I will maybe uh, take notes on some idea about philosophy or maybe some tidbit about health. And I'll create an idea that also links to those themes of philosophy or health, where if I go to that health or philosophy page, I can get to see all the different cross-linked items from the various different books and podcasts and resources that I have listened to in the past or read in the past and can access them from many different angles. So it allows me to just overall keep things as an ever-growing internal resource. At some point, my plan is actually to maybe give people access to that as just a constantly growing resource of my own mind that might be useful to other people, but haven't quite gotten there yet. Absolutely. I could definitely see the utility. Oh yeah. My entire website is actually built in Notion also. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> done a lot of web design and I could code it from, from scratch, could have done it in all sorts of different platforms, but I wanted to minimize my workflow. And therefore I used something that allows me to just take these Notion pages and throw them up on the web with a ton of custom styling that I designed. And then that lets me, if I'm going, like if I create a video, I will embed that video in a Notion page, paste the transcript into it, drag it into my website folder in just my Notion Notes app, and it automatically is on my website as its own page with the transcript and any cross links that I want. And it just populates out very, very cleanly and simply. I love it. Speaking of your reference to your Notion database as your back brain, how important do you think it is for people to have a digital second brain, you know, in the information age in which we're living? And how do people get started if they maybe feel overwhelmed by all the options and how to set up these databases for the first time? The best resource for that in particular is the recently published book by Tiago Forte, Building a Second Brain. It is a phenomenal resource by someone who has been in this space for a very long time. I started building this before he published that book, but I've definitely seen some of his writings before and other similar folks. Some of this whole workflow and the Todoist one is based on uh, David Allen's Getting Things Done productivity system that has then been linked into aspects of the Building a Second Brain system. But that book itself is right now probably the best single compendium of how to go about thinking about and setting up this type of digital second brain with whatever tool you want to use. And he goes over the current tools that are available in a very, a way that is better than I could do in any sort of uh, short time frame. So if you're interested in setting that up yourself, definitely check that book out. As I just mentioned, David Allen's Getting Things Done system is one that throughout the years I've tried to set up, but then not, and then tried and not. It's the type of thing where if you can really get yourself into the habit of using it, it is phenomenal because it essentially offloads the busyness of your mind into a reliable system. So a lot of times, especially for people who have so many different things going on, you can get trapped by moving from task to task without ever fully finishing one and then trying to remember, oh, this is due tomorrow. I got to quickly switch over to this and I don't want to forget this. I make little notes and reminders to myself. The whole point of getting things done is that your brain isn't for storing things about the future. It's for thinking in the present. So anytime something comes up that you want to make sure that you handle, you immediately put it into your getting things done inbox, which is just the overall funnel that takes in everything. And then you periodically go through and sort that into, is this a priority? When do I need to do this by? What category does this fall into? How much time will it take? What is the next step that I need to do to get it done? And then you know that that's part of your system. You're going to get to it as long as you actually make sure to go through that list and operate your day in life by that and I, a way that you can rely on. So then you rely on the fact that anything that comes in, you have the idea, you jot it down, it will be dealt with. You don't have to think about it. And that frees up a lot of headspace and clarity. And Todoist is just a very simple note or to-do list app that allows you to set up different projects, tasks, subtasks. And it syncs across the various different devices and can basically be used for setting this type of thing up and operating it pretty seamlessly for their pretty low cost. If there's a free version that you can do it all with and the paid version is just a couple bucks. Awesome. So I think one of the messages that we're getting here, you know, between the purposes of Todoist and Notion is that our brains aren't really equipped for storing things. They're equipped for critical thinking, for solving problems, and we should outsource the storage to other solutions. 
Absolutely. The entire education system still has to catch up to this. But the system designed in the 1800s of the schoolmaster going and teaching you all this facts and information. Facts are meant to build up connected systems in your brain, not to be the be all and end all. So some people will take this too far and say, oh, we don't need to learn any facts these days because you can just look it up online. But imagine if you're a doctor and you're trying to look up online what that blood vessel is connected to when you're in the middle of operating, that, that doesn't work. Instead, what you need to think about is if you ma imagine knowledge as a tree, sometimes in order to get to the farther branches, you need to have a very solid foundation on the thicker branches. And those fundamental facts are absolutely required. But every time the tree branches out, it gets more and more and more, lots of little minutia that if you're at that final level, those leaves, you don't need to remember the leaves because those are things that you can look up and have. Like, I, I don't know the capital of most of the states. My geography knowledge is terrible because that's not relevant to any sort of downstream activity in my day-to-day -day life. If I need to go somewhere, I will look it up. If I need to find Nicaragua on a map, I will look it up. I don't know where it is. <laughs> but that's fine for me because it doesn't matter. But if there's something that is key towards learning more information and will come together as active practical knowledge that I can apply and helps my understanding of things on a more holistic level, then that type of information is useful. So the brain is good for thinking about things, but for storing extraneous facts, no. That being said, I sometimes will just memorize lots of weird facts because that's fun too. Absolutely. Yeah. That actually reminds me of a TED Talk that Ken Jennings, the famed Jeopardy champion and now current host, once gave about the importance of facts and he was kind of responding to this argument that sometimes people make that we can look up anything nowadays. So why hold anything? Why store any type of information? And his counter was that certain types of information should be available at our fingertips for the purpose of making informed decisions. Like you're saying, if they have, if there's pieces of knowledge that have downstream effects in our lives, we should be cognizant of those. And he gave this one example of a time when a little girl on a beach on some island, she had noticed some wave formations out in the ocean. And this was something she had learned in her geography class, apparently, that this was indicative of an oncoming tsunami. And she had apparently alerted the local lifeguard and no lives were lost that day when the tsunami did arrive. So that was like an example of like when having facts on hand can really be of, of great use and potentially life-saving. But yeah, a lot of extraneous things I think could be definitely outsourced. And I, I guess the challenge is really figuring out which facts are extraneous and which could potentially come in handy. But I think, yeah, that's something that you could potentially logically reason out. Well, that's also the reason for having a system to organize them. So when I offload a fact to my digital brain, if I then am learning something else that I think is related to it, that will make me recall the initial fact or look it up again and connect it to the new one. And now suddenly I've created a mental linkage that is more likely to stay in my mind. And if I build on that at a later point, it'll build even more. And the goal is to be able to create these larger interlinked thought structures that do make you then remember the basic facts more. But you shouldn't start off by trying to memorize the incoming facts. You should make sure that they are stored in a way for easy access so that when they become downstream relevant, you can then make them more intrinsic and better remembered. I love that. And also just the fact that having that digital reservoir allows for recall, which would itself strengthen the information in your own brain. You recently made a TikTok in which you discussed the limitations of fitness trackers when it came to evaluating or predicting energy expenditure. You referenced a study where researchers compared Fitbit, Polar Advantage, and Apple Watch devices. And I believe that these values were off by up to 30% when it came to tracking energy expenditure in the form of calories. What kind of data can we rely on fitness trackers to provide? It's a good question. And the usage of these devices is really, it's overused and underused in several different aspects. So for me, the best use of a fitness tracker is for personal tracking and motivation. It's not for a ground truth. So if I'm trying to calculate my base metabolic rate and figure out Am I exactly how many calories do I need to consume to gain or lose weight? Using the number from your Fitbit is not going to be the best number because as you just said, 
the actual calculation of energy expenditure there is not so wonderful. However, if what you are doing is you are also weighing yourself and tracking what you're eating, and you're seeing that, okay, if I'm walking an average of 5,000 steps a day, and I'm not losing weight, and it seems like I should be based on the energy calculation, then that energy calculation is off, and I can adjust my habit to then get it so that my tracker is saying I'm walking 7,000 steps a day with the same type of like food consumption. So the relative accuracy for you is typically a lot more reliable than the absolute accuracy. It's the same thing when it comes to their sleep tracking. Like I wear a Fitbit and an Aura ring to track my sleep. And do I think that the deep sleep, REM sleep, light sleep numbers that they give me are exactly correct as compared to actually wearing like an EEG when I go to sleep? No, they're, they're not. But the relative performance is actually very useful and illuminating and also serves as a very good base point for motivation. When I started wearing these, the very fact that I wake up in the morning and look at my sleep numbers and I can see that something like having a glass of wine before bed actually will make my sleep numbers be worse, regardless of the absolute way in which it does that, I can see that relative to a normal night, my sleep was worse. And that's something that they're very good at tracking. And therefore, my motivation to not have that glass of wine before bed suddenly went up because I'm a data junkie and it's sort of like a personal gamification thing. I want to be able to actually get a good number rather than a bad number. I love that way of looking at things, the relative versus absolute metrics. And I feel like this is really relevant when it comes to science reporting as well, because a lot of the time when we're talking about the effect of a given intervention, sometimes the media will report a relative risk reduction instead of an absolute risk reduction. Could you talk to us a little bit about how to properly interpret science literature and what these risks mean when media outlets report certain numbers? That is a long, long question, one that I could teach a course on. But to try and sum it up in some accessible way, number one is to look for the words relative or absolute and just think about what that might mean. So for example, a lot of times you'll look at some study that's, or some news article saying this X pesticide increases your risk of cancer by 30%. And you think, oh no, I'm going to die because I ate these Cheerios. And then you start looking at the actual study and you see that, well, when they fed mice a dose of glyphosate equal to roughly 8,000 times the amount that one would get from eating cereal every day for a year, and it increased their rate of cancer by 30%, and that went from a 0.2% chance of getting cancer to a 0.215% chance of getting that cancer, then suddenly the overall risk versus impact on life is framed very differently. As opposed to if you're talking about something where it's like uh, you increase your risk of cardiovascular disease by 50% or 100%, a large, large percentage of people in the United States or the globe end up getting cardiovascular disease at some point in their life. It is one of the leading causes of death. Increasing that risk by 50%, that is a massive, massive impact on the overall potential like, survival rate for your life. So when thinking about these types of relative versus absolute risk, the larger the absolute risk, the larger the relative risk matters and be very cognizant of that. At the same time, though, sometimes even a relative risk reduction versus the cost is still very useful. The reason you wear a seatbelt is not for the absolute risk reduction. It's for the relative risk reduction. Sure, you're likely not going to get into a car accident anytime you get into the car. It, they're very unlikely. But wouldn't you rather that if you get into a car accident, your risk of dying just went down by 50 to 100% because you were wearing that seatbelt, it's an easy thing to do for a pretty large potential benefit. It, it's the same thing for something like a vaccine, where if you get that vaccine, yeah, your absolute risk of dying from that disease oftentimes isn't a massive jump, but compared to the absolute or relative risks and compare that to the rewards, especially on a population level, but even on an individual level, you can do the math and see that the benefit outweighs the drawback. Absolutely. A lot of the time, I think when we're talking about risk in general, I think we forget that the dose makes the poison. And a lot of the time in studies, we're using doses that are close to an, a lethal dose sometimes in these animal models. And that's something to be cognizant of. 
I wanted to ask about your opinion on hormesis or the idea that certain small amounts of potentially toxic exposures can maybe have beneficial effects for us. Where do you think hormesis falls in line when it comes to environmental exposures and how that affects our health? It's a good question, and it's one that is definitely not fully understood in the scientific literature yet. So what I'm about to say is absolutely personal conjecture rather than a solidly researched opinion based on like lots of meta-analyses. This is something that we know in general, the principle of hormesis is accurate in many different aspects of the body. The way exercise works is you're giving the body a level of stress that you're tearing muscle fibers that then it's building it up stronger. There are many opinions that think that a lot of the healthy benefits of eating plants might actually be for like, due to some level of hormesis where you're eating something that is actually a little bit of a stressor on the body because it's a self-defense mechanism of the plant. But in so doing, you're actually stressing the body out a little bit and it rebounds a little bit stronger and the net effect there is beneficial to the body. Things like uh, saunas, you go and you are in this excruciatingly hot environment or cold exposure, very cold environment. And what you're producing is you create heat shock proteins in the body that is a natural response towards stress from a temperature. You can actually produce heat shock proteins, not just from temperature stressors, but that's the primary one. And that has a lot of beneficial effects on the body in general. But if you do it too much, then suddenly you have gone from a beneficial mild stressor where you build up stronger towards a severe stressor that you can maybe suffer some very long-term effects from. The actual best analogy that I like to use for that is from physics. If you think about a spring, there's a spring constant that as you stretch it, it wants to go back to its initial state and it wants to go back to its initial shape. But there's also something within these metals called the region of elasticity. Anyone who has played around with a string or a slinky knows that there is a certain point that if you stretch it beyond it, you've gone from that instant rebound to suddenly stretching it to the point where it cannot recover properly. You have bent it out of shape. It's no longer going to go back. You do the same with a plastic spoon. You can bend it a little bit. It's fine. You bend it too much. It's not going to rebound back. And that's the area where we have to be very careful about with regards to the human body. If you stress it too much, your muscle snaps. It doesn't just get broken down a little bit and recovers. And that's something that you need to worry about both acutely and then also chronically. So there's the issue with environmental exposures is you have to be very careful about what type of exposure are we talking about? Is this something where it is going to stress our body out a little bit and then we're going to recover stronger? Or is it something like mercury where it might slowly build up in our system to the point where then what you get is actual long-term neurotoxicity and health problems that might take a very long time to deal with? Now, the body actually does have some level of mercury clearance mechanisms, but there is a point at which it can really start building up and causing problems, and that point is not too high. So from an environmental exposure perspective, we don't really know which compounds are going to be in one camp or the other, which ones are just a mild stressor that you rebound from and it's totally fine, or which ones will build up and cause a lot of long-term issues. And therefore, it's usually better to try and avoid them whenever possible, but there is a good, if you can look at research that is long-term enough, even observational, you can see, okay, this compound has been in use for the last 50 years. And based on very well done environmental studies that we control for various variables, if you don't see long-term effect on anything that is measured, then that's a reasonable piece of evidence towards saying this is probably not the, in the category of causing severe long-term buildup. Absolutely. So our bodies are resilient in the way that we can recover from some assaults, but not all. And we should be careful to not overwhelm our body's innate defense systems as far as prevention goes, kind of avoiding exposures for which the evidence isn't clear whenever possible. It also matters to think not just from a single variable. So your body's stress response is very multifactorial and many different environmental or interpersonal stressors can all activate the same systems. And there is both how much your body can respond to a single stressor at a time, but it also really matters the total load that you're putting your body under. Like when it comes to breaking down toxic compounds, there are certain enzymatic pathways in your body which have a finite ability to function. There's something called the CYP1A2 enzyme, which is extremely important for breaking down a lot of different things like caffeine, but also cocaine and 
all sorts of other potential environmental toxins. And if you overload it with one, then suddenly its ability to handle another has been reduced. And therefore, when it comes to a lot of these types of stressors, whether it's physical or mental or combination thereof, it really does matter whether or not you are fully overloading your system or taking things more gradually. That's such an important point to make that we need to be cognizant of the cumulative effects of stressors in our environment and not to think of things in isolation because we are handling everything as it comes all at once. And I feel like that also kind of connects back to stressors in general in terms of the effects that they have on our adrenal system and in terms of overstimulating cortisol production because that can have all kinds of downstream effects in terms of harming our immune system, impairing our judgment even, and how the prefrontal cortex functions. And I think that can very quickly become a vicious cycle, especially in our modern environments, because our work lives themselves are quite a significant stressor. And so anything else we do in addition could potentially send us into overdrive. What do you think about alcohol consumption? Because this is something that is a bit contested, I feel, in terms of where the where the line is. Because some research suggests that people who are moderate drinkers maybe outlive people who are completely abstinent or heavy drinkers. But then a lot of other research suggests that complete abstinence is the best course of action. So where do you come down on the issue of alcohol exposure and how much is ideal? You're right that there is a lot of seemingly conflicting research on this topic. But I think that it's a little bit less conflicting than many might think. Yes, there's a lot of large-scale, long-term research showing that minor to moderate alcohol consumption is associated with increased lifespan. But it also seems to be very clear that any amount of alcohol is toxic to the system. It, it absolutely is drinking a poison. The question then is several fold. One, why would, might we see this increase in lifespan or beneficial effect? And two, what's actually happening in our body? Is there a flipping point for the small to the large? So there's a couple of ways of thinking about it. Number one is there is a massive difference between in a single exposure, having a couple drinks or having a lot of drinks. The reason there is your primary metabolic pathway for processing alcohol is first alcohol dehydrogenase breaks down the ethanol into acetaldehyde. And then aldehyde dehydrogenase breaks that acetaldehyde down into things that are a lot less toxic in the body. The buildup of acetaldehyde is one of the primary reasons why alcohol is such a bad effect on the human body because it is extremely toxic. However, if you surpass those enzymes ability to function, there is another type of pathway that the body has for breaking down alcohol, except it's a lot less efficient and produces a lot more toxic by byproducts, free radicals, oxidative products that go and cause issues within the body. So in any given drinking episode, if you are surpassing that basic enzymatic pathway and going into the secondary one, then you are causing many more problems for your body. And some of that is biological, where there are certain genetic SNPs where if you have them, you have a more efficient first pathway and less the second one. So you, you can actually handle more and it won't be as bad for you. But generally, avoid, avoid overconsumption whenever possible. That's the first step. The next step is, okay, so what about staying within that somewhat safer zone? Is this good for me? Is this bad for me? Is there a hormesis effect wherein maybe a little bit actually builds my body up stronger because I'm giving it a minor stressor and then working it out? Maybe that's the reason why there's a longevity benefit. That's not entirely known, but it definitely does seem that one of the primary impactors, the reasons why the minor drinkers tend to have the longer social, well, the longer lifespan is the social aspect wherein Alcohol consumption in modern society is most often a social thing to do. It is an activity that one does with other people wherein the consumption of alcohol actually lowers social inhibitions and creates a greater sense of enjoyment and connection. And there is a tremendous amount of research showing that people with greater social connections have a much longer and healthier life. So it is possible that A, it could be correlational. People who have better social connections drink with them more and therefore end up living longer. It could be that there's even some causal relationship there where people who drink as part of their social activity end up forming better social bonds and therefore have better overall health effects. And all of these can be beneficial, maybe to the point where it's surpassing whatever negative effect alcohol has, even if there is a absolute negative effect from even one drink. 
it isn't really known if that one drink can maybe have a beneficial effect or it's always negative, but all the other effects make it positive. But therefore, my overall approach to it is I will drink socially upon occasion. I will try to limit the amount that I have at any given time. There have been times where I've had a bunch to drink in a given night, and I actually happen to have a very high alcohol tolerance, partially due to said genetic snips where I have a very fast uh, metabolism slash very efficient enzymatic pathway for breaking it down. What I will also do is I have like a stack of seven to nine different compounds I will consume whenever I am drinking alcohol that help to bolster my body systems to handle it as much as possible. Uh, several years ago, I spent a while where I did a very deep dive into the science behind alcohol and basically looked at every single research study ever done on hangovers and the potential effects of things to mitigate them. So I, if I when I'm going out with friends for a birthday party and I walk over to them and I hand them like a little satchel full of pills and I say, take this, it's it's not a drug. It's It's trying to, I think they're a little bit too drunk and I'm giving them something to maybe help their hangover the next day. And I've gotten multiple calls the next morning, like, I don't know what you gave me, but I am not feeling as bad as I expected to. You're here. Have some alpha lipoic acid to counteract the acetylaldehyde that you're about to produce. Yeah, exactly. I love it. If there's one thing I remember from physical chemistry in college, it was that alcohol degradation is a zero order process. So basically, it sort of seems as though the correlation that we're seeing between moderate drinkers and increased longevity could be a bit of a healthy user bias whereby the drinking facilitates social bonding, which is actually accounting for the increase in lifespan. Do you think that there's also potentially a correlation between the type of alcohol one consumes and the, the effects that it has on health? And I'm mostly thinking about this in terms of the polyphenols that are present in red wine and the potential benefits from that standpoint. Of course, this is exogenous and according to my understanding, the antioxidant production that's endogenous, that produced by the body is more important. But there is this argument that perhaps the polyphenols are beneficial for gut health. And do you think that could be playing a role in any potential benefit from alcohol exposure? I would say yes, but more towards the detriment than the benefit. So when alcohol is produced via fermentation, there are things called congeners that are byproducts of the fermentation process that come along with it. And that's why Red wine tastes different from whiskey, which tastes different from mezcal. These are all the things that come along with the fermentation that are part of both whatever like yeast was used or whatever the initial compound that is being fermented starts off with. And a lot of these, like congeners in particular, are the bad things that come along with it. It is generally a good heuristic that clear alcohol will typically have fewer of these than colored alcohol. It is typically just more like distilled, more purified. The difference between a really fancy vodka and a really bad vodka is mostly just the really fancy vodka has fewer congeners. The really bad vodka is just like the stuff from the bottom of the still where more things settle to and you've just got other stuff going along with it, which both makes it tastes worse and also will have a bit of a worse effect on the body. But overall, that's also why you might get a worse hangover from some type of like bourbon or tequila than maybe a nice clean gin, just because you are going to be getting more congeners. When it comes to wine, red wine has many compounds that, sure, there are polyphenols. There's also things like tannins and lots of other compounds that will often be hard on people. And I would say that the negative compounds in red wine are probably more prominent than the beneficial ones. Like if you want to have a lot of polyphenols, then there are sources other than alcoholic products that you're going to get a lot more of them from. You can pop like a green tea extract pill and you're getting a lot more than drinking a glass of red wine. And likely the beneficial aspects are outweighed by the negative ones. I know for myself, Red wine is something that will make me feel worse the next day than almost any other type of alcohol. I still enjoy it. Like I, I really like wine, but especially these days, I will almost always opt for a white over a red for that very reason, because I know its effect on my body will be worse in the short term. And I have no belief that the long-term consumption will be a net benefit to me compared to a myriad of other sources I can get these sorts of polyphenols and antioxidant compounds from. Speaking of physical stressors, you do share your workout routines, including ways to work out when you're easily injured. You recently shared a protocol for working out when you deal with hypermobility or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. 
Could you talk to us a little bit about your experience with hypermobility and how you found a safe protocol despite having this challenge, which is something I can also relate to? Overall, my experience with hypermobility is mostly that I am injured very frequently in very weird ways. It's almost a running joke between myself, my friends, my family. Like, I could go and do some sort of super impressive physical feat that seems like I'd get injured in five different ways, and I'm totally fine. But then I'm walking down the stairs afterwards, and I don't trip or stumble. I just, I'm walking down the stairs, and then suddenly my knee starts to hurt. And who knows what happened there? It just, it just does. And in college, I would, uh, I ran an ultimate Frisbee team for pretty much most summers that then by halfway through the summer, I would have to stop because just running, I, something in my lower body would get injured, not from any trip or fall, I did just running. And then something hurts to the point where I have to stop. So hypermobility in the entire ehlers Downlos spectrum is essentially a problem with the collagen production system in the body where the connective tissue is just weaker and more prone to injury, harder to heal. It just has a lot of problems. Thankfully for me, it's not a very serious issue. Like I have friends with ehlers Danlos who are, it's debilitating in many different ways and it's a very wide spectrum. But one thing that has always impacted me is when trying to do any sort of workout protocol, it is really hard for me to especially exercise my lower body because it is just very easy to injure the connective tissue there in a way that that gives out before the muscles do. So doing any sort of progressive overload to build muscle mass is really difficult. The workout protocol I'm currently doing is the 5 3 one protocol where the goal is to use a lot of volume at lower percentages of your one rep maximum to try and slowly build up towards overall muscular increases rather than doing a lot of work towards the high end of what you can lift. So if I can bench press... 200 pounds, then most of my lifting is not going to actually be at 200 pounds. It'll be starting off at 135 and then going to 155 and then doing multiple sets at smaller percentages of that one rep max, doing a single set at maybe 85 to 90% of that one rep max, and then dropping it back down and doing some more sets at that 70% level so that I'm doing a lot of work in the very safe zone where both my musculature and my connective tissue can handle hopefully trying to build up the resiliency of that connective tissue. And it can take six months to build connective tissue as compared to muscle, which can build very quickly. So one of the real problems with exercise programs is it's very easy for your muscles to outpace your connective tissue and what they can handle, especially if you have naturally deficient joints and ligaments and things like that. Absolutely. That's something that I would run up against quite often when you're putting on the muscle, but the ligaments can't necessarily support it. For me personally, I started dealing with chondromalacia, which is when the knees point inwards towards each other back when I was in high school, and that completely derailed my track career. It just became way too painful to run. So I think it's just it's really great to have a science communicator talking about the challenges that that presents and how to safely work out despite those challenges. So thank you for that. One other thing I would mention, if you have really bad connective tissue issues and are looking for ways of working out safely, number one low impact exercise is always better than high impact. So something like swimming is a lot better than something like running if you're trying to get cardio or even something like a step master or a bike is better than the high impact of running. But also if you really have a hard time with lifting heavy weights, because that's hard on the connective tissue, something called blood flow restricted training can be very useful to simulate the effect of a larger weight, because what you're doing is essentially wrapping bands around the muscles that you're working out to restrict the blood flow to those muscles. And it causes them to fatigue a lot faster. And essentially, it makes it as if you are lifting a higher weight from the muscle's perspective, but the actual load placed in your connective tissue is a lot lower. So there are ways of doing this where you're using a much, much lower weight, but still getting the same sort of effect on your musculature. And in so doing, you can work out pretty effectively with very minimal risk of connective tissue injury. That's brilliant. I imagine that would be applicable for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. Especially people who are older and their bodies just naturally have a harder time with that sort of load, it can be a way of getting it to the point where they can handle that load because you're actually training the musculature to get to that point. Absolutely. Especially with aging and, and sarcopenia, the diminishment of muscle tissue, I think working out becomes really important. But speaking of sarcopenia, what do you think about protein intake as we age? 
because there is some evidence that protein restriction is associated with longevity, but arguably our need for protein also increases due to the loss of muscle mass. Is there a sweet spot when it comes to protein intake over the decades as we age? I think that most of the evidence pointing towards increased protein intake being associated with negative health outcomes has not held up to the test of time in later studies. So I would say it's almost the reverse right now that most people who are older probably don't consume enough protein. And one of the single biggest impactors for aging gracefully is the amount of muscle mass you have. And over the age of 50, like most people start losing around 1% muscle mass per year. And that really builds up. And even people who work out a lot, it's really hard to build on, but you can maintain. So putting on as much muscle mass as possible in your 20s and 30s will really, really help towards better aging later on. And protein consumption is a very important part of that. You get diminishing returns. So people saying you need to have right, one gram of protein per pound of body weight. That's like a common heuristic for putting on muscle mass. And it's true that that amount is actually pretty good at helping putting on muscle mass. But if you have only 0.6 grams of protein per pound of body weight, but you're doing a really heavy workout protocol, you're still going to put on a decent amount of muscle mass. I wouldn't go lower than that. You really want to stay above that threshold for anyone, even if you're not trying to put on weight, getting that amount of protein is a very good thing to do. And that will help many different aspects of health. It's something that people really, especially women, I think, many times they don't consume enough protein, especially later on in life. So it's not just it's not just bone health that we need to be paying attention to as we get older in terms of you know women's health, but they should also be pay paying attention to their muscle mass and supporting that as well. Consuming protein and lifting heavy things. It's a very common cultural thing that men lift weights and women run. No, everyone should be doing both. You're not going to go and put on ugly amounts of muscle. It's really not a thing for 99% of the female population. It's just something that will make you healthier. In terms of muscle tissue as being this reservoir for longevity, what do you think the mechanisms by which that happen are? Is it because of myokine signaling? Is it because of communication with the rest of the body? Why is protein and muscle so essential for maintaining optimal health as we age? It's a good question. And I don't think it's entirely understood yet because a lot of the observational evidence is just that it's observational and it's really hard to do controlled trials with all this stuff. But I would say there really are many factors. So number one is likely just when you have more muscle, you are better able to move your body and maintain an active lifestyle that then has a feedback effect of making sure that things don't drop off in you. Like when you don't use something, it goes very quickly. There are some studies looking at the impact, especially in later in life of a week of bed rest and the amount of muscle lost in a week of bed rest for someone over like the age of 70 or 80 is almost equivalent to what they could put on in a year of exercising. It's very easy to lose it. And when you have not enough muscle to really make it a pleasant thing to do to move around, then you're going to be moving around less and you lose more and more. And muscle is the thing that moves your body. You, you need it for everything. Your, your heart is a muscle. Everything is a muscle. If your muscle starts degrading, then your overall lifestyle is going to be getting more and more sedentary and every aspect of your body gets used less and you just degrade a lot faster as opposed to when someone who's maintaining that muscle and the lifestyle that is required to do so then suddenly has an overall lifestyle that is more conducive towards continuous health, even if it's a bit more difficult to maintain later on in life. So I think that's probably the single biggest effect is just that it makes you maintain a baseline that is much higher than otherwise. Gotcha. So muscle for maintenance is the thing to remember for us as we get older. I love that. Talk to us a little bit about your science communication strategy in general and what's next for distilled science. My communication strategy in general is to let the sources provide the authority but to translate them in a way that is accessible to someone without a scientific background. So I don't like it when someone says, I am a doctor, therefore tr listen to me saying X, Y, Z. There are a lot of doctors who have very little ability to read scientific research and their knowledge is based on some old paradigm that they just haven't taken the time to update. That doesn't mean that I have anything against doctors. It's just that saying that trust me because I'm a doctor sometimes works and sometimes is just completely wrong because that is not evidence. That is an argument from authority. I will almost never give an argument from authority 
Instead, I like to say, trust me because this source, this source, and this source. And if you don't want to go read them yourself, then maybe trust my interpretation of them because I do this a lot. And you can easily fact check me if you want. But for me, it's all about saying I read research and I give it to you in a way that you can think about, apply, and if you want, maybe it'll tempt you to go and do a little bit of your own reading and maybe improve your ability to do so. And in terms of my overall plan strategy going forward, generally when I take a, when I approach a topic, I do a very, very thorough literature review because I don't like anyone being able to say, oh, but what about this? You're actually wrong. I hate being wrong. So I want to be right. And therefore, in order to film a 60 second TikTok video, I will sometimes spend 12 hours, 20 hours just reading through research papers where I've got like a note file of 50 different citations that then I end up talking about a single study or two studies and it just doesn't come across. So, but the problem is short form content audiences don't really have the patience for more detailed stuff. So going forward, my plan is really to do this sort of detailed research and use that to create a long form, well-cited article and probably YouTube video that then I will take and take the juiciest bits and turn that into some short form content. And all of it is really around how can we take cutting edge medical research and apply it to enhance, improve our own lives and function in a very hands-on practical manner. I love that. And I'm a little bit reminded of Bertrand Russell's Ten Commandments of Learning, I believe, where he said that you should reject appeals to authority in favor of evidence. So I love that approach that you have. But also, I find that when it comes to science and medical communication, there's a lot of nuance involved because, as you've said in a lot of your videos, we don't have clear-cut answers to everything. And we can just follow the evidence where it leads. But a lot of the time, the most you can say is, this is what we know as of now. The jury is still out on a lot of these things. And I think communicating that nuance also kind of helps build trust with your audience as well. One of the things that I find the most frustrating about the whole science communication field, and there's very few ways around it, is essentially the people who sound the most confident are generally the least knowledgeable. Because if you have someone who says, eat this, it is good for you, it will do X for you. And then another person saying, well, this probably benefits this based on some reasonable amount of data, but we don't know for certain. The latter person is a lot more likely to be correct because there are very few things, especially in the world of health, that are 100% known. Knowledge is constantly advancing. Studies that are done on a thousand people, those thousand people all have individual biologies and the effect on one person might be totally different than the effect on another person. But people are attracted to confidence. They are attracted to simplicity. And someone who can give them a clear, clean, don't eat this, it will kill you. Eat this, it will make you super powerful. It's very attractive. And that's why alongside all of the type of practical health or whatever advice I like to give or talk about, I also really like talking about cognitive biases and just ways of thinking and approaching every aspect of life. Because if you can understand the pitfalls that your brain naturally falls into, then sometimes you can at least work towards trying to avoid them. And when it comes to science communication, the more uncertain someone is, likely the more trustworthy they are. Absolutely. I was speaking to a rhetorician on one occasion, and he was talking about how equivocating in science communication kind of harms credibility, just because as you're saying, people are kind of drawn to those confident, bold claims. And I mean, how exactly does one even navigate that? Like you're saying, there's a lot of heterogeneity. There's a lot of variability in responses to drugs, in responses to different types of medical interventions. And I guess perhaps this also kind of highlights the need for precision medicine. And I would really love to see a move that kind of embraces heterogeneity more. Because the thing is, a lot of the time, our interventions, even if they are targeted towards the average the average might consist of a very small percentage of the population. So that's something that I think medicine is still grappling with. But what do you think about the future of medicine in general? Do you see us moving towards more personalized, targeted interventions? 100% yes. The future of medicine is precision medicine. And we are now starting to have the tools to do that. The way that medicine developed from the 1800s through late 1900s is basically taking the approach of what diagnostics will give us the most bang for buck that a human can understand. It's 
what single marker can we use that is indicative of many different things that a doctor can look at and get useful information from? Things like blood pressure and blood sugar levels and white blood cell counts in the blood, all these things that they can look at and it's indicative of all sorts of stuff. And then we try to work to narrow it down. What the future is really going to be is we try to gather as much information as possible. You'll do a blood panel, a urine panel, which will have 200 metabolites being measured that very few physicians will be able to look at and immediately parse and say, oh, I know exactly what's happening here. Yeah, maybe there might be some who are really focused on whatever might be coming out. But in general, data interpretation and multifactorial analysis is what computers are really, really good at. So we're going to move towards a world wherein when you try to figure out what's wrong with someone, you give them a battery of tests that have thousands of little things being measured. And in aggregate, the machine will be able to say, these are likely the systems that are being impacted. Now that can, then gets fed to the doctor who is able to use a more holistic approach to look at and look at the patient, compare that to the output, compare that to the inputs and use that as a guide to then say, okay, now we are going to create a very targeted approach that ideally is based on studies that have been done with this sort of precision type of tooling, which will allow us to have much better targeting for the interventions. We might even get to the point where drugs are synthesized for the person with many little nuances rather than just the same thing being given to everyone just based on your genetics, your current metabolome, your like everything to do with who you currently are. We're going to try to personalize things as much as possible. And we're a ways out from that, but we are seeing the beginnings of it. It's very exciting. What do you think about the argument that this is economically more costly, but potentially the prevention side could really reduce healthcare burden as well on the system? How do we potentially transition to this more personalized approach, even though it might require more investment upfront? It is a problem with the existing medical system, the way that the money flows. So it's, it is something that is a, at an institutional level is going to need a lot of change, but thankfully there are certain players within the space that are very much incentivized for preventative care. There is no doubt that on a public good, public health perspective, preventative medicine is by far the best approach. So right there, something like the government would really want to incentivize preventative care because the billions of dollars that get spent on Medicaid, Medicare, they're the ones paying for the various drugs and treatments that then go to deal with these chronic conditions and long-term care issues. So right there, the government is the single largest payer that will benefit from a preventative approach. Unfortunately, they're also the slowest mover and slowest to change, and it's really hard to prove anything out with them. Therefore, the way that change will likely happen is first through the payers that are more agile and likely backed by things like insurance companies and self, uh, well, employment, the large employers. So some employer that sponsors their own health plan is the one actually paying for the healthcare costs of their employees. And therefore, they will be incentivized to have a healthier employee base. If Amazon could do something that will make their overall employee base 10% less likely to get sick, that is a massive cost savings for them for actually treating them because the cost for prevention versus curing is very asymmetrical. So I think that type of intervention will likely start at those large payers who really want to reduce their costs and maybe care about their employees or constituents. And they will try out systems that then there will be enough data to get government level adoption to create more widespread change. And yes, that will reduce the profits of things like hospitals and pharma companies, but I think that's not a bad thing. Do you think that there needs to be a shift in medical education towards more preventative approaches rather than the diagnosed drug paradigm that we currently operate under? Definitely, yes. I think the overall amount of time spent in most medical schools on addressing topics like nutrition and exercise and how they can play into the larger picture of health, that needs to change. It's really not something that is dealt with enough and therefore not something that's even thought about. Similarly, the way the entire medical system is structured is very much based on silos of knowledge and expertise. Your neurosurgeon has one area they will deal with. Your cardiologist will 
deal with it, something else, your neurologist, something else. And you go to someone and it works. The Western medicine system is very good at treating acute problems. You have a broken leg. They can help you. You have a failing pancreas. They can help you. They can, things that are very clear cut with a single source. It's very good at helping with, but as soon as you move towards more chronic conditions, autoimmune issues, things that deal with multiple systems in the body, suddenly you go to the neurologist, you go to the neurologist and they say, oh, you have migraine. And then you say, oh yeah, but you know what? I also had this like uh, bacterial overgrowth in my gut and some peripheral neuropathy and uh, you know, some narcolepsy issues and all of these things come together based on some underlying problem that maybe also is associated with a thyroid problem and all of these are interlinked in a way that your standard doctor is going to look at and say, uh, well, maybe talk to the neurologist and talk to the, uh, the, the cardiologist here. And everyone's got their own little area where they say, well, okay, I'll give you like a Botox injection for your migraine. And that's not the problem here, guys. Like it might help this one symptom, but it's not going to deal with the underlying thing. There was a study a little while ago looking at, uh, fibromyalgia, which is one of these very top down. Oh, you're experiencing pain. It's full body pain. We don't really know what causes it. So we're going to give it this label. It's fibromyalgia, but there could be a lot of potential causes. And this study looked at 50 fibromyalgia patients and tested them for SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and found 49 out of 50 of them tested positive. That's essentially where bacteria from the large intestine have migrated into the small intestine and start causing a lot of problems that propagate throughout the body and cause a lot of issues. And it is thought that maybe that is one of the potential many underlying causes for a chronic pain condition like fibromyalgia if this overall gut issue is not properly taken care of. But that's not the sort of thing your standard neurologist will know about, let alone test for. Absolutely. A lot of time with these diagnoses of exclusion, you are dealing with an umbrella term and root cause analysis is necessary because like you're saying, fibromyalgia could have multiple root causes. And this isn't just the case for diagnoses of exclusion we're finding. You know, even things like diabetes, sometimes we find that there's different subtypes depending on where the issue is originating. So I definitely think that medicine could do a lot more in terms of operating from a root cause analysis standpoint, just in terms of achieving remission and, and reducing overall healthcare burden, not just for patients, but for the systems in general that are equipped to deal with them. Functional medicine doctors are ones that are typically known for looking at holistic approaches, full body systems, rather than the more traditional everything by themselves type approach. One thing that I have really experienced and noticed a lot in the last year, year and a half, having been very much in the health and wellness space for a long time, as well as the biohacking space, the sort of more holistic side of the spectrum, but then also existing a lot in the medical space, talking with a lot of traditional medical doctors and virologists and epidemiologists and a lot of the COVID stuff. And there's very much these two very disparate camps. You've got the folks who are very into the holistic approach for everything, and you've got the ones who are very into the, into the traditional approach for everything, and they often will disparage each other a lot. And you've got one side where your medical doctor says, oh, this person is just peddling supplements, and therefore you can't trust them at all. And then the other person is saying, well, you know, this person denies that a supplement will ever even work, and look at all these research studies that say they do, and they therefore they're just idiots. But at the same time, you do have a ton of people on the wellness side of the spectrum who are selling you things that absolutely have almost no evidence that they're going to work. And they've gone very far off the deep end. And because of the walled garden of information, will often honestly believe things that are just bogus. And then they're selling some good and some bad all packaged together and people have a very hard time picking it out. And because of that, then the traditional medicine side of the spectrum will look at them and say, oh, you can't trust these guys at all because of X, Y, and Z. And they're just in it for the money and selling you a bunch of like random stuff that's just going to give you expensive urine. And there is very much a divide there that needs to be bridged because there is a middle ground wherein a lot of the things talked about by the functional camp has a tremendous amount of actual scientific research behind it that is not acknowledged by a lot of the traditional camp due to the lack of transference between medical research and medical practice. But there needs to be much greater oversight on the wellness functional camp as well, because 
there is a ton of stuff that goes on there that really is not very effective and doesn't have the right level of research behind it. And that's really where I'm sort of settling is in the middle of those two camps is I am extremely open to trying everything, to researching everything, to doing things that your standard doctor might think is absolutely weird. Like, why are you doing that? Why do you spend 10 minutes at night in front of a massive panel of red lights while lying on an acupressure mat and using a post electromagnetic post electromagnetic field device to do other things? And like, there's all sorts of stuff that I will try and see, you know what, is the N equals one experiment worth it? Can I measure a change? Does this have any research behind it? What is the risk versus benefit payout? And is this something that might help? But that has to be done in a rigorous evidence-based manner with an open mind, but grounded in reality and the scientific method. So it's uh, sitting in the middle. That really is my sweet spot. Absolutely. Yeah. Those are definitely difficult, difficult worlds to bridge and like traversing the two, I think requires a lot of personal investigation and, and hours dedicated to pouring over research and figuring out what'll work. And of course, like you're saying, going through the end of one experimentation I do feel like incorporating concepts like energy metabolism, mitochondrial function, gut dysbiosis into mainstream medicine can be quite beneficial just in terms of finding root causes and figuring out where things are breaking down from a communication standpoint. Like you're saying, though, in the alternative medicine space, there are a lot of nefarious players as well. So I think it can be hard to separate out the good from the bad. But there is quite a considerable lag, as you alluded to, between things kind of moving from the bench to the bedside. I'm kind of thinking about how FMT, that was originally an alternative medicine treatment, but now it's pretty well established that it is quite effective for antibiotic resistant C. difficile colitis. But it also is used for so many things that it really doesn't seem to be very effective for. Like FMT is something that, yes, there are certain studies that showed it to be effective in certain contexts, and then it became very popular as an alternative therapy, as almost a cure-all. Like, oh, get someone with a healthy biome and put it in me, and then I'll have a healthy biome. And you know what? There's also a lot of risks involved in said procedure because you know bacteria can be good and they can be bad, and they can work with some bodies in ways that they don't work with other bodies. And an understanding of in what areas does it work or not, we're not even there yet. So yes, it's the type of thing that maybe could be very effective to cure more things than we have proven it to be effective for, but it also could be detrimental and people really need to understand the risks and benefits rather than listen to people who are saying, oh, this is going to totally cure your chronic condition and nobody wants to, you to know about it because they don't want you to know because pharma will lose money because it's you, you can't patent someone's poop. Absolutely. I think there's a couple of issues with FMT in its current form. One, there is this lack of standardization because you're essentially using a human product and depending on your donor pool, you're getting different material every time. So I think um, until we have some way to standardize or make this more of a homogenous process, it'll kind of be like the wild west of experimentation. But second of all, as you're saying, some microbes might be beneficial in one body and not another. So there is that personalized aspect to it as well, because I think sometimes you have what in the research is alluded to as hologenome dysbiosis, whereby you're introducing microbes into a host that didn't co-evolve with them, in which case a host immune system might flag those microbes as foreign and then mount an, a deleterious immune response to it. So I think one, the, the product itself isn't standardized, and two, there's just so much host microbiome interaction that we're not accounting for. So I do think that the therapy is far away from being applicable in a way that we can identify what will work for which person. You know, that being said, there are certain associations that we've observed. Like if you have a donor that's rich in bifidobacteria, that's more likely to induce remission for IBS patients. If you have donors that are more enriched in certain butyrate producing bacteria, that tends to give a higher remission rate for ulcerative colitis. But again, we're just scratching the surface. And I do think we're a long ways away from making it a safe and effective protocol across the board. Exactly. As you said, the the amount that we know about these different species of bacteria or even just genus of bacteria are we're just scratching the surface. Like we're at the point where we know that the gut microbiome impacts so many different aspects of health 
and we are starting to get very small levels of understanding of the interaction between different types of bacteria and different bodily systems. And we have some types of things that can be helpful with it. And hopefully in the next 20, 30 years, maybe five, 10 years, we will start getting to the point of being able to make much more directly applied interventions based on that knowledge. Technology has been advancing to the point of allowing us to have greater tools for both analysis and application of diagnostics and interventions related to health. And we're now at the point where we're starting to play around. We're making use of these tools in a way where we're just really touching on the beginnings of how they can be applied to make a really big difference. But simultaneously, what we're dealing with is the mindset and institutions surrounding medicine and technology and their intersections that really are in their infancy in terms of how they can all work together to create different overall structures that can help to improve people's health and lives. For me, at least, what I like to do is try and make people aware of both the emerging tools and applications that exist, and then help them both be ready for that newer reality of health and also maybe participate on the ground floor and help that reality be achieved to make for a healthier, better working, more effective, more efficient population. I love that vision of the future that you describe. And thank you for highlighting the complexity inherent in health and disease in general. Let our audience know where they can find you online. So you can find me on all of these socials at Distilled Science. That's on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. It's technically Distilled Science, lacking an E because there's a character limit, which is really annoying. So it's Distilled. No, no E after the Distilled. So people don't find me on Twitter. I barely use Twitter. Maybe that's the reason. You could also go to my website at distilledscience.xyz. Sign up for my newsletter. Check out all the random stuff that will be slowly increasing as it uh, makes its way there. Or just see what it looks like to build a site in Notion. Absolutely. Yeah, twofold. One, signing up for your newsletter. Two, figuring out what it looks like to build a site in Notion. I love that. Thank you so much for your time, Avisha. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Always good to have interesting conversations in the field of health science and self-improvement. I tend to nerd out a little bit about them too much. Definitely. Please come back again soon. I hope to do so. All right. You can find the show notes for this and all other episodes at the Substack URL linked in the show description. You can also review the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, or Podchaser. Thanks so much for tuning in. Until next time. Yeah. Also, I don't have that sort of like smooth, sonorous voice. Well, we're just going to sit back and relax (laughs) and talk about the universe. I love it. That seems like the intro to Cosmos or something, just like a Carl Sagan documentary. 13.5 billion years ago, the inception of the universe.